Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all very much for coming. This is the uh, Nana Nap session, and I've asked the uh, AV staff to turn the lights down in the house a little, so if you do go to sleep, I won't be able to see you. Um, how do we all go in Bali and Lombok? Interesting, eh? Yeah, I uh, went into uh, Bali for the first time without my wife in tow on this cruise and we went to uh, Kuta Beach and I thought that um, I could have a quiet beer whilst sitting at Bintang while sitting on the, the bench there. Well, uh, I had that many seagulls flock around me, just about as many as what there is people in this audience. And uh, I was offered everything from genuine fake Rolexes to um, genuine fake Viagra. <laughs> I need to try that one. <laughs> Might have some explaining to do when I get home back to Perth to my wife. Anyway, uh, interesting experience. And I enjoyed Bombok yesterday too. I went out to uh, Mount Rinjani oh, yeah. for the first time and I'll talk about that later in the lecture. Uh, but anyway, for those that haven't been to my previous lectures, this is the third, I'm not sure, the fourth, uh, in a series of six that I'm doing on this cruise. And it, uh, my name is Philip Schubert. I, uh, done, I had four occupations in my working life uh, decide, before I decided to pull the pin and go and do some creative things and that's landscape and uh, travel photography. So I enjoy, I do a lot of travel now. Um, I only uh, photograph in Western Australia, my specialty where I grew up and have lived in many places. Enough about me. Um, Today's lecture is Volcanoes, Earthquakes and Tsunamis with the subtitle The World's Most Spectacular and Destructive Events. Um, they are, the, the ship passes through the Ring of Fire, we're actually in the Ring of Fire right now, uh, and the area has the highest density of active volcanoes in the world. And also obviously lots of earthquakes and uh, tsunamis are, are a frequent occurrence in the area. So. In this lecture, I hope to give you some of the reasons why it happens here, show you some pictures, uh, the processes involved. I, I trained as a geologist way back in, in the early 70s and uh, haven't looked at a rock since, um, but I do love looking at landforms and land processes and that, so, um, and hence my interest in landscape photography. Um, as I mentioned previously, I went to uh, Mount Rinjani yesterday and we were lucky enough to have a clear day and we could actually see the top of it. But that's a big that's a big volcano that one. <coughs> so moving right along. What causes earthquakes, volcanoes and tsunamis? Um, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of uh, geological and geomorphological theory here, but I think it does actually add to the interest and you'll discover some interesting facts. Um, we tend to think the Earth, as humans, we tend to think that the Earth is very solid. Um, it's not moving. The, you hop on a granite rock on the land and it, it just seems so permanent and forever. But in fact, the, the Earth is like a a golf ball or, a, a, or even a um, orange uh, with an orange peel on the outside which is the, the crusts and, and the plates and so it's it's quite flexible that the um, earth actually has a tide uh, of about 30 centimeters each day with the like the water uh, but on the surface these plates float around on the surface of the uh, mantle uh, and these are continental plates just like ice ice plates on a lake. And of course they bump and crash into each other and they grind against each other and some of them tilt up and some of them lift up and some of them get pushed down and that's exactly what's happening to the uh, surface of the earth, um, well the entire surface of the earth and the area that we're in at the moment is a particularly interesting one. You can see here the plates of the earth. We're sitting uh, just in here at the moment on the Arabian plate, the Eurasian plate, but we've come up across the Anglo-Australian Indian plate and that's part of the ring of fire around through here. And this plate here is moving to the northeast at 2.4 inches a year. 
that, which may surprise somebody, but uh, if, if you're down here in New Zealand, the movement uh, is, runs up and down the island. Uh, it splits virtually the South Island in half, so if you own land um, that crosses that particular fault there in a thousand years' time, you might have to have it re-surveyed. Um, could, be, could be interesting, isn't it? Um, but it is, it's, it's quite, and the other thing that is happening is that this plate here is actually tilting under the Arabian plate and the Pacific plate. So if the back end here, or the, the southern end is actually lifting up, and the bottom front top end here is actually sinking under the, uh, this plate here. So what that means, of course, is that sea levels are actually rising across the northern areas of Australia, and on the southern areas of Australia, they uh, in some parts, uh, the sea level has actually dropped nearly 300 metres. Um, if any of you have been to Cape de Grand National Park in the, over here in, near Esperance, um, you'll see sea caves that are now nearly 300 metres above sea level. So there's a... <coughs> A uh, diagram showing the ring of fire fundamentally around the uh, around the top between the Australian plate, the Eurasian plate, and the Pacific plate. And of course, we're sitting in here. And I'll show you the significance of that in a moment. <coughs> the Earth is not still. It's this is 25 years of movement around the Earth. You can see the vast majority occur on the boundary of the plates. And we just heard about the Chilean plate, the Chilean. Uh, earthquake a couple of weeks ago when I was on the cruise, uh, that generated a tsunami and that tsunami actually went under the ship, it's about an inch high I believe when it got here. But uh, certainly the Australian area here is very, very active. I took this at 10am uh, ship's time this morning. Earthquakes are happening all the time, in fact there was a magnitude 4.7 earthquake here at um, Nusa Tengara at uh, seven o'clock this morning and there was another one over here um, on near East Timor and that was a 4.4. This one here was 230 kilometers below the surface. We all tend to think of the surface expression of uh, earthquakes you know, where we see faults and destruction and stuff like that, but generally they are well down underneath the surface of the earth. And this is what happens when the plates collide. This is, if you look at the, if you think back to the Australian plate, this is the Australian plate sitting here with the oceanic crust, and this is the Indonesian archipelago. What's happening is as, as Australia moves north, it's actually being forced down under Indonesia. Uh, and that's, uh, that's why we have the Timor Trench and the, um, uh, the Java Trench. This is up to 3,700 metres deep, that little nick there, but this, as the crust, as it moves northwards, it gets forced further down and further down. And of course, we all know that the centre of the Earth is actually molten, uh, and this stuff, with the pressure gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Water gets down in here, minerals get down in here, and eventually it starts to melt. And because when it's melted, it's, the density is, is often quite lighter than the, the overlying rocks. And so these things start to float up like hot air balloons almost underneath us, um, and they're massive, uh, you know, they can be many, many, many kilometres across, and they slowly melt their way up through to the surface um, of the Earth, and this is called a magma chamber. When they get up quite close to the surface, they tend to expand because the pressure has come off, and eventually they'll find a little crack through the surface and they'll start spitting out um, lava and uh, ash and steam and all sorts of things like that, and I'll explain that in, in a moment. First onto earthquakes, I think we're all familiar with uh, earthquakes. Fundamentally, one side moves with reference to the other one. And this, this is a uh, vertical movement earthquake. Very easy to see. Um, if, you, um, if you know what you're looking at, you'll see that a sudden, what's called a discontinuity on the fault where the sedimentary layers suddenly move. And, and geologists use this to uh, measure the age of faults and also determine all sorts of geological things about it. Um, obviously a river comes up, so it'll form a little gorge there and reconnect up. So that's a vertical movement fault, and that can be directly vertical, it can be oblique or, or uh, obtuse. And if it's obtuse, meaning 
that it comes, it leans back to the left this way, obviously the top stuff falls down and it, it's very hard to determine the difference. Then you get the transverse or slip uh, type or shearing type um, earthquake where fundamentally the, the, the each side of the fault moves horizontally with respect to each other. And you can see that you don't get a discontinuity of the, uh, lab, the, the various layers of sandstone and other material underneath, but you do see it in rivers. It's quite obvious uh, surface expressions in the hills. So that's a very simple explanation of what happens in an earthquake. And of course, you can have combinations where you can have horizontal movement and vertical movement at the same time. And in fact, most, earth most earthquakes have movement in both directions. Um, that's a popular, um, not misconception, but that's a, a popular uh, picture that you may see on earthquakes. This is not actually a fault. This is just actually a slump uh, caused by an earthquake. So often you will see uh, fault damage, what appears to be fault damage, in an earthquake that in fact is just slumping of the soils as it, as it shakes. Uh, and if, I don't know if, if you've been down to the beach and you shovel in some wet sand into a bucket and give it a good shake, uh, eventually the, all the sand settles down and the water will come to the surface and you end up with uh, li liquefaction. And when that happens with earthquakes, you get what's called mud boils. And so mud will come sort of pouring out uh, of these cracks and that. But I don't, I don't actually have a picture of that. The Boxing Day tsunami was triggered by a massive earthquake. I do apologise for the quality of this image, but uh, from where I'm standing, uh, you can see uh, Java, sorry, Sumatra down here, and the Andaman Islands, and uh, very difficult for me to see here. But fundamentally, the earthquake happened 160 kilometres off uh, the coast from Bandar Aceh, and it was in a north-south orientation. Uh, it, was, it was the third largest earthquake in recorded history. The, only the 1960 Chilean earthquake and the 1964 Alaskan earthquake were actually bigger than it. And it was 9.4 in, I won't say Richter scale because I've changed that for some reason. Um, there's a, a new scale, but 9.4 is right up there with the top. It occurred at a depth of 30 kilometres under the surface of the, the earth, not the ocean. So it was right well down into the, uh, into the uh, earth. And in, in the movement, it, uh, there was 10 metres of movement laterally, meaning that the Pacific, oh, sorry, the Indian Ocean, this side, went north 10 metres. And also it went up five metres. So if you could imagine, the whole western part of the Indian Ocean suddenly got five metres shallower. Where's that water going to go? It's going to spread out all around, all around the world. And that earthquake actually raised sea level 0.1 of a millimetre worldwide. It was so big, um, the earth rang like a bell. Uh, it's like hitting it with a hammer. It, it shook the earth and it continued ringing for about two or three days. And the, it actually shortened, but slowed the Earth's rotation. So on that particular day, it was 2.48 microseconds. So the day got shorter by 2.48 microseconds. Sorry, it sped it up. And of course, if you know anything about physics, you actually got microscopically lighter that day. The centrifugal force as the Earth is spinning, throwing you away, and your body mass attraction into the Earth. Um, so it was a good, good way to lose weight, but <laughs> um, it's estimated that 32 cubic kilometres of water were suddenly lifted up. That's a massive amount of water, a massive amount of energy. And of course what happened, it, um, it went places, and I'll talk about that in a little while. Move on to volcanoes. Volcanoes, uh, as I pointed out, you go up, through as these bubbles of magma come up and rise towards the surface of the earth, the pressure is getting less and less and less from the overlying rock. So all the gases and stuff that are, that are compressed into the, into the molten stuff begin to start to boil. And if, when they get close enough to the surface and if the pressure drops quick enough, it suddenly boils just like a Coke 
uh, could grab a can of Coke or a champagne bottle and give it a good shake and flip the lid, boom, off she goes. You get a, a tremendous eruption. And fundamentally, that's what happens. This is the magma chamber down here. The pressure suddenly released at the top and boom, up she goes. all sorts of different types of volcanoes. That was one that I spotted uh, in Java on the way up, um, a classic cinder volcano. I'll explain that in a little while, but you can see the classic cone shape with the vent in the middle. And this one doesn't have a caldera. We'll talk about that in a bit too. But I was really pleased we had a clear day and there was another one over here and there was another one here and there was another one here. An amazing place to see from the air. So, crater or caldera is the question. This is a classic uh, textbook, schoolboy, uh, university uh, demonstration of a, a volcano, a strata, what's, what's called a strato volcano. You've got your molten <coughs> rocks and stuff way down in the earth. You've got your magma chamber rising upwards, melting its way upwards towards the surface. And eventually, it'll, it'll find a weakness, a crack, but that the breach, it breaches the surface and suddenly it'll boil and off she goes and it's, they spit out huge quantities of uh, ash and gas and, and uh, pulverised rock and some will actually even spit out lava bombs which can vary in size but they pure molten lava and will eject it um, 5,000 feet in the air and they'll, they'll go up and they'll come whistling down. You wouldn't want to be in the road of one of them. But fundamentally the lighter material, or sorry the heavier material sort of runs over the edge or just collects around the vent itself and the lighter material blows off with the upper atmosphere winds and this is the ash and dust um, that, we, that I saw yesterday in Rinjani, it was quite very impressive. So depending on the prevailing direction of the wind at high altitude and low altitude this cloud will go out and this ash will rain down <coughs> around the countryside but fundamentally that's, that's a normal stratovolcano. Apologise for the quality of this image here again. It's the only one I could actually find. But what most people think is a volcano is in fact a caldera. And a caldera is just a normal strata volcano. It's got its magma chamber down the bottom here. And it erupts away happily for varying periods of time. And it builds up a classic uh, strata volcano cone. But then when the magma, magma chamber down here gets empty, um, you get a bit of an earthquake or something around and suddenly the whole thing just collapses down into this massive chamber underneath underneath the uh, way down in the earth and you get these calderas um, <coughs> form and they can be 25, 30, 50 kilometres across uh, so you, that gives you some idea of the size of these um, magma chambers and they, they fall down and then of course in the tropics and most other places they start to fill up with water the water's pretty warm uh, initially, but it cools down, it's full of minerals and some interesting places to swim. Um, here's some volcanoes that are uh, in the area that we're actually cruising at the moment. Um, I, this is not my picture, I had to uh, get permission to use this one, but this is Rinjani on Lombok, um, erupting in 1994. Uh, that would have to be a spectacular sight. The, the reason why you get uh, lightning in the, in the cloud is because lots of static electricity uh, develops in the ash cloud and so that's a typical um, pyro, what they call a pyrocumulus. Um, not a good place to fly a jet and I know there's a couple of people in, in the audience here. Um, this earthquake, sorry, this um, ridge only went up in 1257. Uh, it was the largest eruption uh, in written recorded history, in other words, since man's been able to, to write. And it, uh, the caldera that was created there is six kilometres by eight and a half kilometres. So you can imagine all that stuff all falling down into the, into the magma chamber and, of course, everything else going up into the atmosphere. Its most recent eruption was in May 2010. Um, and it, it, it's quite, it's, it's amazing. It's nearly 3,790 metres high from sea level. And, uh, you know, that's getting up towards the freezing, well, close to the freezing level. Uh, we can be down at sea level here at 27, 28, and uh, at those altitudes, the temperatures are very much cooler. 
when it went up in the 13th century, uh, it's believed that it threw so much stuff up into the atmosphere that it actually triggered the Little Ice Age, which commenced in, in the 13th century and went right through until about 1680, uh, where the world uh, temperatures dropped quite significantly. Um, you'll read stories about the Thames freezing over and um, uh, the glaciers moving down hills and all sorts of stuff. So there was a very significant period of cooling. It wasn't the only volcano that went off at that particular time, but the amount of smoke and ash and dust that went into the upper atmosphere significantly reduced the solar radiation coming into the Earth during that period. And, you know, if you look outside here now, we've got smoke. Uh, it's um, That's reflecting a lot of sunlight, and of course that's what's happening around Southeast Asia here at the moment with all the bushfires. It's the solar radiation that you reach in the surface of the ocean is considerably reduced. Um, there is, you can actually do a three-day hike uh, up, up Rinjani. Uh, but for those of us that did the tour yesterday, there was some very fit-looking young, young Indonesians there. I, maybe I might be a little bit beyond that. I, I'll see if I can find a sponsor and get a helicopter up there one day. Um, I'd love to get some photos up there. Um, Krakatoa. This is not Krakatoa. This is just one little steam vent on Krakatoa. Krakatoa went up in 19, sorry, 1883. Uh, it was the biggest explosion, deadliest and most destructive volcano in recorded history. Uh, the eruption began in the afternoon of August the 26th and it sort of rumbled and puffed away and not too many people were worried, but the next morning the whole thing went up. Half of it collapsed down into the magma chamber below and the rest of it went up into the atmosphere. It created a very significant uh, tsunami because the, as the magma chamber collapsed, all the water across surrounding the island rushed in there, boiled, um, massive destruction, massive noise. Uh, it destroyed the island and it caused 38,000 um, deaths and it was heard uh, as far away as South Africa, Alice Springs, pretty, pretty significant event. There was 105, 165 villages destroyed, as I said, 34, 36,000 people killed. Um, since 1927, it's commenced erupting again, and this is Arnak Krakatoa, or Child of Krakatoa. Um, I saw that in 1975. I did a cruise um, from Fremantle to Singapore and around. We went through the Sunda Strait, and as we went through, we could this is not my photo, but we could sort of see this almost identical to that. And I was so excited, I loved it, enjoying the Swan Lager out of the can. Um, Pinatubu uh, is the second uh, in the Philippines. It's the second largest volcano that uh, that's exploded uh, in this century. Uh, this is this is a pre-puff. This is not the actual explosion itself, but it did. Um, puff away for a few days beforehand. I think Clark Air Force Base is not far from it, so it was well recorded, um, the uh, photography of it. And this is just uh, some minor explosions that were going off prior to the caldera collapsing. It's up to that point in time, nobody knew that it erupted. There were people living everywhere around it. and uh, But with this pre-explosion stuff, a lot of people got out and that saved a lot of lives. Um, on the cruise down from Fremantle, or from Singapore to Fremantle, I spoke with a uh, Filipino waitress in the Romeo and Juliet dining room, and she said that she was living not far from this uh, as a child when it went up, and she said that her little brother enjoyed eating the ash. Um, and there's a significance in that in the next couple of slides. That's a picture of the caldera after the collapse. Nearly 800 metres off the top of the mountain disappeared. That's just an incredible, the, the peak was right up here, it either went up into the atmosphere or it fell down into the magma chamber. And so that now is a very significant um, caldera sitting up the top there. Uh, it threw about 10 cubic kilometres uh, of material into the atmosphere. And uh, that's 10 times larger than uh, Mount St Helens. And just to give you an idea of that volume, uh, that's roughly 40,000 times the volume of this ship. 
thrown up into the air in a short period of time. A lot of material. The summit was obliterated, uh, but more importantly, vast quantities of minerals and metals that came to the surface on that one. And so there was about 800,000 tonnes of zinc, uh, zinc uh, 600,000 tonnes of copper, copper 550,000 tonnes of chromium, uh, and so on and so on. But it also brought up a lot of toxic heavy metals, um, nearly 100,000 tonnes of lead, 10,000 tonnes of arsenic, um, 1,000 tonnes of cadmium, and 800 tonnes of mercury. And of course, mercury doesn't go very far because it's pretty heavy stuff, unless it's a vapour, so this area became quite contaminated with um, heavy metals post the, post the uh, eruption. So if you go there now, this is what you'll see. It's become quite a uh, tourist attraction. The lake, when it began to fill, was at about 50 to 55 degrees. Uh, it's actually co it's cooling down now. I think it's about uh, 32 or 33, but popular tourist attraction, you get a hike up there. Coloration is due to the heavy metals and uh, other chemicals in, in the water there. So perhaps not a good place to swim, but maybe okay. One trip I did on radiance of the seas, we pulled up at Banoa, uh, virtually the spot where we were a couple of days ago. We had a lovely clear day, and you can see Ganon Agul, uh, that was the, the tallest uh, volcano on, on Bali. That's, that's got relatively recent eruptive history, but the one that particularly interests me here was Kintamani. This is the edge of the caldera on Kintamani, and I was able to get a taxi up there, and so we did some did some photography and did some exploring. Um, it's probably a very large caldera. It's 22, there's actually two calderas at, at Kintamani. This is the outer one, which is 22 kilometers from there to there, and there's another smaller one in here that happened. Uh, it went up about 25,000 years ago, uh, so not too many people were around then that could recount that. But interestingly enough, inside it's got a couple of little active, active vents still going. And these things periodically erupt. And you'll see, oh, that, that's just a quick view of, of the part of the caldera. This is the wall around the edge of the magma, magma chamber that's collapsed in. So there's a quite a big lake in there and there's four villages in there. It's quite a pleasant place, but uh, it can be quite different at times. This is Mount Petua, which is, a, which is another small volcano that's developing inside the magma chamber. So there's actually three vents here, and you can see that they erupt uh, and pour out basaltic lava quite frequently. And one of the guests on the last uh, cruise uh, said, look, I've got a picture of this uh, in 1976. So you can see that this lava's come out of the third vent here, run all the way down. If you actually go there, there's not much vegetation on that at all. And the Indonesians, enterprising engineer, uh, Indonesians are always looking for opportunities, so they're actually mining it now and using it for uh, road surface material. But if you want to climb Mount Petua, you go up here, and then there's a, a track up up to the top. It's quite a popular tourist spot now. Just another uh, shot of one of the, the small vent that uh, was the last one to spew out the uh, the lava. Move on to tsunamis. This, this is a picture of a tsunami in Japan. It's not the Fukushima, Fukushima uh, one. It's just another one that uh, somebody actually got a picture of, but that quite often misunderstood. Um, we hear about earthquakes and we hear about tsunami warnings and this one's not creating a tsunami and that. And there's very good solid reasons for that. Tsunamis are not waves, ocean waves in the truest sense. That they're actually a temporary rise in sea level. And so, uh, it, it, it's caused by undersea activity, uh, but as the sea level as the sea level comes up, it doesn't break like a traditional um, wave coming ashore um, or swell that you'll see. It's, it's just it, it just rises up and it just starts to build momentum as it tries to go in. Then they are. Um, there was a tsunami on while we we're on the last cruise. There was quite a significant tsunami um, from the Chilean earthquake that happened during that time and there was about a three metre uh, tsunami went ashore on the nearby shoreline in, uh, in Chile. And this is the reason why tsunamis sometimes happen and why they don't. If we think about the 
the Boxing Day Sonoma that happened in the off Phuket and um, Bandarache would all be going. What actually happened, this is unfortunately reversed, this part, which is the Indian Ocean here, went up and created a, a massive uh, shock wave on the surface of the thing and of course you've suddenly got all this extra water on this side of the fault which has got to go somewhere. And the Boxing Bay tsunami um, was didn't do much damage to the north but it, it was very very active east-west because the orientation of the fault line was parallel with the coast and I can show you the uh, some things on that. Uh, it, it was very devastating. Um, Bangladesh, oh sorry, um, Bangarache, there was estimated 250,000 uh, people uh, died during that occasion and not all just around the Indonesia area. There was a lot killed in Ceylon, India and even as far away as South Africa. Uh, Ethiopia, Ethiopia got particularly hard hit and you'll see that in the next slide. But this is this is uh, a little village in Bandarache. We did a cruise past here a few years ago on, on a cruise ship. But the water actually came ashore here at about uh, 15 metres deep. And as it went round the corner here, it actually rose to 100 feet you know, above sea level uh, in terms of height. So anything that was in its path wasn't actually smashed, but just sort of moved by the, the sheer volume of water. And so you've got cars and anything that wasn't tied down smashing and crashing into each other and, and if you're a person in there, well, um, you most likely be killed by being crushed by something rather rather than drowning. Although a lot of a lot of kiddies did die there because they couldn't swim. Surprisingly enough, many of the uh, males, uh, older males in, in this uh, particular tsunami were out at sea fishing. So it was particularly hard hit on the women and children. Tsunamis travel fairly quickly. Uh, this is the boxing, uh, the spread of the tsunami in terms of hours, but about 16 hours and it spread all the way down to, to, to Antarctica, across to uh, South Africa, and of course down the West Australian coast. And, and some of us remember in West Australia there was a few people washed off the, the uh, sandbar at uh, Penguin Island. And that was the Boxing Day tsunami that actually caused the sea level to come up down there. So it, it travelled out fairly quickly. Um, Indone uh, sorry, the Thailand and uh, Bandarache got hit pretty quickly because it was quite close to the fault and deep water. Here is a uh, quick, um, a quick demonstration of what happened with that uh, uh, tsunami as it curled around here up the, the uh, west coast of India across here to Somalia, really hit hard there, and across around, even down here to South Africa. Um, quite interesting. The, if you look further down the uh, Sumatra coastline, the, the wave was actually travelling in a southerly direction. Um, virtually. So the main activity, main energy was released in an east-west direction, not north-south. Had it been north-south, it would have been absolutely devastating up here in Bangladesh because it's a very low-lying country um, with poor drainage. It would have gone many, many kilometres in there and there would have been millions killed, I can assure you. Here's a picture in, uh, I think it was in Thailand somewhere. Uh, you can see quite happily there's boats sitting out here, totally unaffected. Um, it out, out of that sort of area there wouldn't have been much more than an ocean swell and uh, they probably wouldn't have even known that it actually existed but what, what people don't realise is a, a tsunami will sometimes the sea will recede initially and this is what happened in, in Patong and other places it, uh, it went right back like as if it was a very low tide uh, and then it, it, it wrote, people were actually walking out on the beach looking at the, at the seabed and of course then it came back in and it, it rose and it was quite quite a significant event for anyone there. Where there was a, uh, th this is a demonstration of where there's some restriction to uh, to the tsunami coming ashore. There's obviously a seawall here uh, and perhaps the, the coastline was a little bit uh, shallower or sloping a bit more gently so it actually got up a bit more uh, high. But look at these guys sitting there. They didn't stay there very long. This guy was not very happy. Um, that was in Thailand. Devastation was just unbelievable. 
anything that wasn't tied down, all the, the stuff that you see in, in Southeast Asian cities uh, just gets up and move, all the street vendors, all the stuff. Because you, you may have noticed in Bali that most buildings have shops down the bottom and people live up the top. So all that material, everything just all floated out and away it went. If you were, if you were a child or a small person, you can imagine you know, there's water up to this depth with all that material in it. Um, not nice. Surprisingly enough, it didn't actually flatten a lot of buildings in uh, Bandar Arche, but the damage on the lower floors was just horrendous. We are going to Phuket. I, uh, I was hoping to get back to this exact spot on the last cruise, but didn't make it. But maybe on this cruise I intend to get there, but uh, I, I do, I've got a fair idea exactly where it is. The, there are some markings in the restaurants and in the street vendor halls at the end uh, that they draw the line where the tsunami went to. But at the time was quite a significant event. It um, really messed things up there for a while and it was a uh, something to most remember. Um, that'll bring, that brings me to the end of this particular presentation. Um, it is a little bit shorter than the other, so I've got um, a reasonable amount of time for, uh, for uh, questions from the audience. Oh my god. Uh, I'll start over here on the right. Lake Tobe, the question is uh, in, in Sumatra, was it? Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with it, uh, I, I couldn't comment. But yeah, it, it probably is, yes. Um, there's certainly that many volcanoes and, and calderas in Java, it's almost certain risk. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's correct. The question is, on the news last night, there was uh, uh, additional earthquakes in Chile. That's quite common. Uh, I think they were magnitude 4.6, 4.7, reason, reasonable size, but nothing like the one that they had. Um, but that, that'll rattle on there for weeks. I think you saw in the slide that I showed you of the Andaman, there was over a thousand aftershocks uh, after the main earthquake <coughs> that happened on the Boxing Day tsunami. <coughs> yes, sir. The question is, is there a difference from an explosion on a mountain uh, to that on level ground? Um, I, 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 I'm speculating here, but uh, if you have an explosion up in the air, you have the possibility of, of the shock wave travelling downwards. Um, that's why they explode atomic bombs a thousand feet in the air or, or higher, because the shock wave, the blast wave, it's down that's much more effective in destroying things. So I would suggest, yes, it's probably uh, more effective in destroying things if it's up on the top of a volcano. Any more questions? <coughs> yes, right at the back there. Can you find how the Richter scale The question is, uh, could I outline the, the Richter scale? Um, it, it's, it's a long rhythmic scale, uh, it's not uh, a linear scale, so uh, an earthquake that's 4.7 uh, in magnitude is very, very much less, it, it's many thousands of times less powerful than why one say that it's um, 8.3 or, or above. And I think that, just to give you an indication, I went through the 1967 earthquake, metering earthquake in Perth, and up to that point in time there was no real known uh, earthquakes in West Australia. I was sitting in a high-rise apartment on the edge of the Darling, sorry, the, the uh, Kings Park escarpment, actually on the toilet when it happened. Uh, there, was, there was no niceties when I exited that building that time, I can assure you. I thought I was going to buy a building over the edge. Um, but no, it, it, it's a logarithmic uh, scale, so it meant, meaning that for every uh, change in number, it's actually doubling in intensity. So when we get up to the 9.3, they're millions of times more powerful than something rather that's 2.3, 2.4. They're, they're only little, tiny little things. Oh, yes, sir. I thought that they have fossil fuels adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Do 
Um, the question is, uh, these days there's a lot of um, fossil fuels being burnt and adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Uh, I'm, I could say to you that the volume of CO2 and material that volcanoes put into the atmosphere is enormous. Uh, it is absolutely staggering. Um, I, I was aware of some statistics, I can't think it off the top of my head at the moment, but uh, it, it's one particular volcano put out the, the entire amount of CO2 in one puff uh, than what Germany puts out in a year. Um, <coughs> an indication. Uh, but, you know, climate is changing. I, 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 I wouldn't uh, say that it isn't it's certainly changing, and for whatever reason, it's still up there. Yes, sir, in the middle. Yeah. Um, I'm having difficulty hearing you. Oh, okay. Um, the question was the um, young boy eating the ash uh, from the volcano. Um, look, I think when we were all kids, we all had a little bit of little bit of sand in our diet. Um, I remember that. But uh, certainly, the ash that I saw yesterday was very. Uh, very grey, very dusty, um, probably contains a lot of silica uh, in it, uh, and it would have um, heavy metals in it, uh, but you'd have to ease a lot, I think, before you get into trouble. Yes, sir, right up, up the back. You uh, mentioned in your last talk you was going to pass a volcano, was that the one that's causing the problem now with the airlines? Um, the Mount Ray, Agung Ray, Raya, um, I'm not sure the pronunciation of it, that's on the, on the eastern end of Java Island, about 120k from Vanoa where we stopped. Yes, that certainly created a lot of issues for the airlines, as you're well aware. The, the, the main problem is that it's the dust, or the, the dust that actually gets ejected high up to contains an awful lot of silica in it, and it, it gets onto the, the turbines. The, the very hot turbine section of the aircraft uh, engines and it actually fuses onto the turbines and that changes the shape of the turbine blades and of course jet engines are very fussy about the shape of all their blades but no, I, I don't believe it's erupting at the moment if it is, it's only as much as a cigarette smoke. Yes ma'am. Yeah. Uh, the question is, the tsunami from Chile, would that have affected the broom um, uh, port stop? Uh, no, look, it, uh, it was on the other side of Australia. It, it, it travelled, the tsunami actually travelled through the South China Sea, where we are here now, reflected around the uh, Kalimantan, Borneo, uh, it wouldn't have got through the Sunda Strait, uh, which is only a very narrow uh, entrance, and also Lombok Strait. So it, it was probably only about an inch high when it actually got to this point here. Yes, sir, up the back again. Uh, the question is the Bandarache area uh, close to the uh, tsunami in 2004. Uh, look, a lot of reconstruction has gone on there, but you can imagine uh, suddenly you've got 100 tonne of seawater, um, well, sorry, 100 foot of seawater uh, floating around on your, your fertile pastures, and that it, it's, it's not particularly good. There's a lot of salt. No, it's No, no, because the, 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 to, to rephrase the question, is it act, is the, where the Bandarache uh, tsunami went ashore, is it still underwater? No, it drained back to a normal level. No, the, the seabed is still five metres higher. Uh, there are the geologically active there's still tremors along there. As I said, there was one this morning at uh, Noosa Tangara, which is down on the southern end of that um, particular zone. Yes, sir, on the right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, question is, is there any relationship between fracking and uh, earthquake activity? Uh, potentially, yes. Um, 
I certainly I, I'm aware that the super pit in Kalgoorlie, for the people in West Australia who would know of the super pit in Kalgoorlie where they've got a massive great hole in the ground, um, that's actually triggered quite a, a new area for earthquakes in that particular area. So there's tremors around uh, Kalgoorlie reasonably frequently and that's because the amount of uh, weight material that's been taken out from the super pit. So look, yeah, quite quite probably you, you may get some movement settling uh, lubrication um, from fracking. Um, I'm aware that the Ord Dam, uh, West Australians once again, uh, there's such an amount of water went into the Ord Dam when it first, uh, weight of that water actually caused a number of tremors in that uh, particular area. One up there, the back there. Um, where is Krakatoa with respect to us now? Krakatoa is, which one are we pointing? So, <laughs> We're pointing towards Singapore, so it's behind us and on the uh, port quarter. In other words, behind and on the eastern, sorry, western end of um, Java Island. So uh, it, it's quite away from us. It's, not, uh, interest, it's really interesting going through this under straight because you can actually see Arnak Krakatoa there. The currents, of course, are quite strong there. But the, the Caldera has just created a, a new archipelago. Any more questions? I'm conscious of the time. I better wrap it up. So I thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure having you, and I hope you found it interesting. I'm lecturing again tomorrow on uh, sashimi and bluefin tuna, the world's most expensive fish. A little bit different today, but I think you'll find some very interesting information. I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you.